So I'm going to share this tweet right quick. And this is from More Perfect Union. It says, Stewart Shops now employs 175 millionaires. Stewart's is a chain of convenience stores in the Northeast and it's worker owned. That's what they say. The chain's success combined with being worker owned means that 175 employees now own $1 million or more in company stock. As the 175 partners with a balance of more than $1 million is up from 2020 when the 90 employees own more than a million dollars of company stock. In 2018, there were 67 employees with more than 1 million in company stock. So there are companies that also, you know, give stock to their employees. So they're, you know, part owners, you know, and, um, they're part owners also in their companies. Like for instance, one of the biggest grocery store chains in Florida is Publix. Some of you may know about Publix. Some of you may not know about Publix, but Publix is a store chain, sometimes overpriced in my opinion. Well, many times overpriced, but the customer service is typically really good and the stores are super clean. But yeah, their prices are a little on the high side. And so when they say they're employee owned, it's like, what's the difference between an employee ownership and a worker co-op? So they're, they're, they shared an article and I wanna go to that article and let's see what it says in more detail. So it says the Millionaire Workers Club at Stewart Shops keeps growing. Employee ownership means that local convenience store chain now has 175 workers with more than $1 million in company stock. As the number of stewards millionaires has expanded again with 175 workers at the convenience store chain owning more than $1 million worth of company stock through the company's employee stock ownership plan or ESOP. Stewards this week sent out its annual stock ownership statements outlining how it has made a $19 million contribution to 3,000 active employees accounts. That's equivalent to 16% of each employee's 2022 wages. Additionally, ESOP, Employee Stock Ownership Program, participants saw their account balances grow by 12.5% in 2022. Store shops employees own more than 40% of the companies through profit sharing. 175 partners with a balance of more than $1 million is up from 2020 when 90 employees own more than a million dollars of company stock. In 2018, there were 67 employees with more than $1 million in company stock. Stewards has expanded since then, steadily building and adding more stores across the capital region, parts of Vermont and the Hudson Valley. Of the employee millionaires, the company 70% started out as hourly employees. Even with the challenges of the economy, supply chain issues, and rising costs due to inflation, we are elated to be in a position to share this generous ESOP contribution with our partners. It is only possible because of their hard work, efficiency, and their pride as owners that we have had other success, another successful year. So that was from Gary Drake, the store shop president. ESOP program is 100% funded by the company for anyone working at least 1,000 hours a year. Now that sounds like a lot, 1,000 hours, but if you were to take 1,000 hours and divide it by 52 weeks in a year, that's under 20 hours a week. So that's not really a lot of hours that you have to work in order to be part of it. So, which it sounds nice. It says after six years in the plan, a partner's balance is usually greater than a year's pay. The company has noted that the ESOB plan has created a lot of stability 
which could be a competitive advantage in this area of employee shortages and recruitment challenges facing many businesses. The stewards has position. Okay. So that's what they talk about with steward shops, right? And I'm going to share with you guys about Publix as well, because this is more local to me. There's literally a Publix right down my street, like a block away. And so this is from the corporate site for Publix. It says facts and figures. It says here are a few facts about the company. We were founded in 1930 in Winter Haven, Florida by George W. Jenkins. We are the largest employee-owned company in the United States. We are one of the 10 largest volume supermarket chains in the country. Hang on, let me make this bigger. Our retail sales in 2021 reach $48 billion. We currently employ over 240,000 people. We receive numerous awards for being uh, blah, 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 yakety schmacky. And then it has all the Southeast locations, which Florida has 848 stores. Uh, nobody else comes close. So we, there's more stores in Florida than in the rest of the Southeast combined, basically. And then their distribution centers, manufacturing facilities. So, you know, that's one of the things that we were always touted about Publix was Publix is a employee owned. So you have stock in the company, which means it's even better than the corporations. And, you know, if you guys really want to get into it then you guys, you know, can get into employee ownership. And I'm like, OK, well, that sounds kind of cool. But is it the same as uh, a co-op or a worker co-op? Let's get into it. Let's let's look at some facts and figures. So this is from ESOPpartners.com. It says ESOP versus cooperative. Why your employee ownership choice matters. This came out last year. It says business owners planning their succession and leadership transition are taking a closer look at employee ownership models like employee shop ownership plans, ESOPs, but ESOPs aren't the only employee ownership structure to consider. ESOP owned companies and worker offer important potential benefits to employees and business entities. But what should a company owner consider and understand before choosing the two? For those keen on democratic worker control, a worker co-op may, may be the right choice. On the other hand, the significant tax benefits of an ESOP can create cash advantage that can help the company thrive through its ownership transition and beyond. Plus, ESOP flexibility may allow for planned government governance rules that employer empower employees with similar rights to create a democratic structure. If that kind of worker control over the business is desired, so it's important to think about why you're considering employee ownership and what might be within reach before assuming it's one or the other choice. So here is what the facts are. So meaning of ownership, worker cooperative says workers become direct owners of the company. I'm gonna repeat, workers become direct owners of the company versus the ESOP says, the ESOP trust is the legal owner of the block of the corporation shares up to 100% of the company for the benefit of the current and future employees. A worker cooperative and a worker co-op, workers, owners have a controlling ownership interest. That is to say, worker owners make up more than 50% of the total combined voting power of all classes of stock in the corporation. Versus the ESOP it says ESOP employees accrue share allocations while working and typically receive the value of their share allocations, most often in cash and at retirement or separation from service. So let's go on to number two voting rights. A worker cooperative says 
every worker owner has one equal voting right. In the ESOP, employee owners may not have voting rights as determined and articulated in plan documents. The ESOP appointed trustees serve, serves on behalf of employee owners in most cases. Under worker cooperatives, worker owners may not, I'm sorry, worker owners may or may not choose to elect a board of directors or delegate account, uh, accountabilities to working groups. These structures can depend on the size of the business. Under our ESOP, democratic governance is neither required nor prohibited. Under here, it says it is important to understand that democratic principles don't always mean every single decision gets to a vote, even in a cooperative. Rather, it is about shared governance and mutual agreement and the accountability of management and leadership to the stakeholders. For this reason, both ownership models perform better with in-depth, consistent communication. Number three, employee eligibility. It says criteria for member eligibility in a worker co-op is articulated governing documents can include minimum work tenure, hours work per year, buy-in payment, being voted in by current members. All workers who meet eligibility criteria may become cooperative members, but not, are not required to. In the ESOP, it says at minimum, ESOPs are required to cover a substantial percentage of non-highly compensated employees who are at least 21 years old. So anybody who's between 16 and 20, they are not eligible and who have completed one year of service. So you have to have worked there for at least a year. So you do not have any, uh, you don't have any shares until after a year. Certain employees may be excluded from ESOP participation. ESOP eligibility requirements are subject to IRS non-discrimination non testing and are articulated to plan documents. Four, payment of dividends to employee owners. In a worker cooperative, a majority of allocated earnings, i.e. the portion of net income designated as surplus or losses go to worker members on a patronage basis as described in the co-op's governing documents. In the ESOP, not all ESOPs choose to pay dividends, but they may. Dividend payments for an ESOP-owned C corporation may be tax deductible under IRS Section 404K2, Section 2. Taxes. Worker cooperatives. A worker cooperative pays income tax on its profits, and worker owners must be paid reasonable salaries subject to payroll taxes rather than pay the whole salaries as patron dividends to avoid payroll taxes. Allocations of profit to patronage dividends allow the co cooperative to have worker owners take on some of the tax responsibility as individuals. The 20% federal pass-through deduction creates a tax break. ESOP says the ESOP-owned corporation of an S-corporation is not subject to federal income tax. So 100% ESOP-owned S-corporation pays $0 in federal income taxes. It says an ESOP-owned C-corporation can benefit from the tax deduction mentioned above. Financing. It says in most cases, workers each contribute a buy-in amount, i.e., each purchases a voting share, and the cooperative secures a loan for the rest of the sale price. Members' equity are rarely enough to cover the sale price. Seller notes are commonly part of the sale structure. For an ESOP, it said leverage ESOP sales are often more of a combination of lender and seller financing. Employees do not buy into plan participation. Non-leverage at sale ESOPs are rare, but in most cases, the company would contribute the cash to ESOP and the ESOP would purchase company shares. So this is the line by line facts about the difference between uh, the, this is, you know, going to buy the facts between what is, you know, a worker co-op and an ESOP. Uh, and there is, uh, there's a lot of information regarding this. Um, There's another one that I wanted to go to. And this one's going to be a, a little bit more in-depth and detail. So 
make sure this is big enough. It says ESOP versus worker cooperative. What's the difference? A worker cooperative is an employee owned business in which each member or worker owner has one equal share in the business. This also means that every worker owner has one equal vote in the co op, no matter their pay or seniority. Of course, different work co ops have different structures. Some are more hierarchical and have managers and elected board of directors, and sometimes an elected board president. However, at the end of the day, those leaders are accountable to the full membership. And in fact, a manager and or co-op president only has one vote and one share in the business, like any other worker owner. While the board makes major strategic decisions and management has operational authority, both are ultimately empowered and by and responsible to full membership. Worker co-ops that are more collectivized or horizontal in their structure with no internal hierarchy are often very small enterprises with a few notable exceptions. Tasks and decisions may be delegated to individuals or groups, but the board, the top governing body, is made up of all the worker owners. It says, in addition to the worker co-op world, there's a thing known as patronage dividend. Basically, this is member share of the business profits at the end of each year. According to co-op principles, it is allocated based on patronage, which in a work co-op means hours worked. Sometimes the formula takes into account additional factors such as relative pay. But because worker owners each have the same membership, no share, membership share, no single person can receive a higher return on their investment from owning more of the company. So it says the ESOP has a completely different ownership structure. This is because a separate entity, a trust, acquires some portion, sometimes all, of a company's stock and holds for it the benefit of employees. The companies generally appoints the trustees who administer the plan, which is largely retirement or separation benefit. So one of the major things that sticks out to me is in a worker co-op, you'll get uh, what you basically, what the entire company makes in profit, you'll get that at the end of the year, right? Every year, you'll get the profits. Boom, boom, you get a check. And you may have to pay taxes on it, but you'll get the the prop, the, you know, the, the check and as far as the profit, right? Versus the ESOP, it's the only time you actually get that money is either when you leave or if you retire. So that's one of the that's one of the things. And also ESOP is not subject to democratic. A, dem a truly democratic say within the company. Uh, it depends on how you know how they structure it. But worker co-ops, democratic say from every single worker. It says ESOPs are not cooperatives. There is no direct ownership by workers of company stock, and there is no requirement for democratic governance. Employee shares do not generally confer voting rights, except in a very specific rare circumstance. That said, a growing number of ESOPs are 100% own 100% of the company stock, and that does change the nature of the enterprise. ESOP companies that invest in workforce education and have participatory, particip I'm sorry, participatory structures enjoy productivity gains compared to non-participatory non-employee owned companies so that is really the difference between the two right and so this is why it is very important when people say oh it's employee owned it's like but well, what type of employee ownership are you talking about are you talking about an employee stock ownership program or a worker cooperative because from what it looks like to me you have more agency and more control in a worker cooperative than you do in an employee stock ownership program. If I work in an employee stock ownership program, I don't have a voting say in who manages me. I don't have a voting say in who runs the company or if we decide to have a, a board of directors. I don't have a voting say in that. 
Also, what if I'm 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, and I want to work for a worker cooperative? Well, I join in. I already have a say. But, and I start getting, I start getting the, the profits, you know, at the end of the year from, you know, from the point on where I'm working. I may not get all the profits from my first year of work because maybe let's say I start in June or July. I may only get six months, you know, of that. But then the whole next year, then I'll get it all for the whole year. But if I work for ESOP, I have to wait till I'm 21. And even then, if I'm 21, you know, there may be some restrictions. And I won't get it if I leave. I'll get it if, only if I retire or if I leave. But I won't get it every single year. I'll just get the just the pay. Now, let's go here. This is from the Atlanta Journal Constitution says, could employee ownership help narrow the racial wealth gap? This is very interesting. It says Morehouse Research suggests Equity from worker cooperatives can build wealth for black Atlantans. Nigel Jones, practically giddy, taking large cardboard box out of an industrial fridge. Inside the chill box are what Jones calls the best pecans in Georgia. And Jones, 29, should know. In 2014, Jones, who was they that, who uses they then pronouns, started the pecan milk cooperative a black queer worker owned co-op they have been using different nuts to make plant-based milk since 2013 first just as a batch of almond milk using their roommate's blender but then quickly turning to pecans i actually would like to try pecan milk that actually sounds interesting the idea of running a traditional business did not appeal to jones which is what led them to create a cooperative which the employee owners were owners of the company. The new report from the Morehouse College International Cooperative Labor Studies program highlights how the equality and wealth building that comes from an employee ownership can address current economic challenges for small businesses and ultimately help narrow the racial wealth gap. So this is also very important, especially those of us who are black. The six members of the Become Milk Company co-op, I'm sorry, have, all have an equity and what they're building to make decisions about the business collectively. So this is also very interesting. It says Metro Atlanta's uh, income gap persistent over decades. And so if you look, it talks about Metro wide at 77,589. Uh, white households get 92,988 versus black households get 60,966. Atlanta has the highest income inequality among major U.S. cities along, I'm sorry, according to recent Atlanta Journal Constitution analysis of data from the United States Census Bureau. The median income for a black household in Metro Atlanta was around $61,000 in 2021, while the median income for white household was more than 50% higher, roughly $93,000. Differences in the rate of home ownership, another marker of wealth, were also stark. In 2021, 53.3% of black households in Metro Atlanta owned their own homes, compared to 78.6% for whites, according to the data from the U.S. Census Bureau. So this really shows about how it also is, you know, beneficial in closing that racial wealth gap. And so this also shows about, you know, this is, you know, about worker co-ops. There's another um, one that I also want to address as well, as well. Is this what? Okay, yeah. This is from the Transactional Law Clinic Collaborative. It says, what is a worker co-op? And so this gives the facts about worker co-ops and how worker co-ops work. 
So I think, and it also talks about how to convert to a worker co-op and it gives resources on worker co-ops. So this is also a very cool article as well that you can actually download. I found this to be interesting. It says workers get to participate in the profits, oversight, and management of the organization using a democratic process because the risks and the rewards are shared. A co-op makes entrepreneurship opportunities more accessible and stabilizes jobs when owners retire. So, yeah, this is, you know, a very interesting thing to, to really look into because a lot of times people will sit there and go, well, aren't they all the same? Well, in reality, no, they're not all the same. And I think that people really need to know what is what because at the same time, a lot of times, you know, I'm sorry, what? Hold up. Hang on, hang on, hang on. You said, dude, who cares what happens in northern Alaska? And I corrected you on that. And then you said nobody even lives there anyways. And I corrected you on that. So facts are not a tax. I'm sorry. But I'm sorry you felt attacked. But at the same time, like, nah, bro you're you're the one who's sitting there talking about you know you don't care about what happens to the you know there because you're basically having this flippant idea about what happens to people in those areas i mean i'm done with that segment already but you know the thing is is that you're asking you're demanding an apology for something that you said that i actually corrected you on and if you're not willing to apologize to you know to me for making that uh, a you know, amorphous, you know, idiotic statement. I'm sorry, but dude, no, like, come on. Are you seriously going to sit here and, you know, get mad at me for correcting you on something? Especially when you said it in such a flippant way, not caring about our environment or the people who live there. Are you kidding me right now? Do you know what channel are you on right now? Come on, Rick. Let's be real. Right. Anyway. Like I was saying earlier about co-ops, but um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm done with them. But as far as uh, the worker cooperatives, uh, let me see. There was another one that I wanted to take a look at. Um, I think that was the last one. Yeah. So as far as what I consider to be more. um. <laughs> Holla, Jam Mom. <laughs> but the thing is, I think that, you know, uh, as far as what the way I see it and the way it reads to me is that a work co op is actually uh, a more better, a more better deal, especially as far as having the, it's better, especially as far as having a more democratic say in your workplace. Thus, meaning that you actually have more of a control over how the establishment operates. And if you have more of a control over how the establishment operates, especially when it comes to daily operations regarding what's going on, then that's an even better deal. Because then you're not going to sit there and, at, you know, try to, over you know, sh ship your jobs overseas. You're not going to ruin your environment, you know, through... Uh, different types of practices that are going to affect you and your families that live in that area. You're not. You're actually going to be better for your community. And you're going to, you know, as far as stakeholders concerned, you're going to, you are a stakeholder and you're going to try to make sure that everybody, including the environment, benefits from it. The same thing with like Conical Phillips. If Conical Phillips, uh, even though I don't agree with fossil fuel companies, let's say they were you know, uh, either, in, uh, in, you know, worker owned, or let's go even further. If they were, you know, government owned, then okay, sure. That'd be cool. Because the thing is that they're not going to screw themselves. They're not going to shoot themselves in the foot as far as the way it goes in those countries.
Actually, that's a really good co question, Gene. Anyone here in a cooperative? If you are, let me know. I actually would like to know. I'd like to know. All right, so. I was looking for something. She's Black says, uh, I'm a case manager for a nonprofit and the board makes all the decisions. We don't have a representative. I wish we had a co-op. Roger Meadow says, JB, Pete, DM, state AGs have authority to revoke corporate charters when they have a state. Let me get to it, Roger. <laughs> Let me get to it. I'll get to it. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Jumping over me, man. Anyway, I'll continue reading. It says corporate charters when they've established a record of egregious behavior against workers, consumers, putting the economy and communities at environment at risk. I'm gonna I was gonna get to that, Roger. <laughs> I got you, Roger. We're on the we're on the same wavelength, bro. bro. I got you. So where is, wait, oh, wait, here's, here it is. I found it. Goodness gracious. <laughs> I see what you're saying, Roger. <laughs> Roger's, goodness gracious. Rogers, Rogers just be hitting me up, bro. Um, this is in response to what Roger was saying, and uh, this is actually really interesting as well. It says, "What is corporate charter revocation? Corporations are created by state law when the state government issues a corporate charter. A corporate charter provides special benefits that are not available to citizens, such as limited liability and perpetual life. In general, grant." of these privileges through corporate charters serves the public interest because corporations promote economic growth. But in virtually every state, corporate charters are conditioned on good behavior. Some corporations abuse their privileges by repeated violations of the law. For this reason, state laws have long authorized state officials to revoke the charters of corporations that exceeded or abused their legal authority. How does a corporate charter revocation action work? The plaintiff must prove to a court that the corporation has exceeded or abused the authority that the state has given it. The attorney general has already had the ability to file cases in court. The model act allows citizens and shareholders to do the same. Though they must meet the specific threshold of alleging three different corporate felonies in a 10 year period. The MBCA already specifies the court's powers and produces in this type of case. The model, I'm sorry, the model act does not change any of these procedures, only who can bring the action in the first place. And so this is a video that I would like to show. Recently, there's been a string of horrendous crimes involving death, money laundering, and the destruction of public property running rampant through the US. The worst part is that many of these offenders haven't faced real justice for what they have done. These criminals may not be whom you expect because they're corporations. Most are just made to pay a small fine for what they've done and then go on with business as usual. Corporate charter revocation is a way for the public to hold these repeat offenders accountable. Offenders like BP, Massey Energy, and HSBC who have gotten away with some of the worst crimes in recent history. The first repeat offender is BP. Most wanted for environmental and economic devastation, BP has committed hundreds of crimes, including the Deepwater Horizon spill, the largest oil spill in U.S. history that dumped 4.9 million barrels of oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Although BP has been fined around $4.5 billion to be paid over five years, if their yearly profit of about $25 billion stays the same, less than 3% of what the company makes will go toward the fine. 
BP tripled its spending on ads in the three months after the disaster. Corporate criminal number two is Massey Energy. Massey has engaged in repeated violations of law, contributing to the deaths of 29 people in a coal mine explosion in April 2010. Investigators later wrote over 100 pages on how Massey repeatedly placed profits ahead of workers' safety and compliance with the law, and how this lack of safety culture took the lives of these miners. Massey's CEO, Don Blankenship, retired in 2010 and walked away with a retirement package worth over $80 million. In November 2014, a federal grand jury indicted Blankenship on four criminal charges. Meanwhile, he remains free and Massey has been acquired by another energy company. Corporate criminal number three is HSBC. HSBC admitted violating money laundering laws covering $200 trillion in transactions. With customers, including terrorists and Colombian drug lords, one might expect a criminal prosecution. Instead, the Justice Department opted for a financial settlement of $1.9 billion, which is about five weeks of income for the company. Their bonuses were clawed back, partially. When people commit crimes, they can be sent to prison, or worse. Why are these businesses allowed to continue their activities when they've shown they have no concern for people, property, or the greater economy? According just, a, just a note, wouldn't it be nice to see, you know, these corporate shills like people like Jamie Dimon and, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, for all the crimes that they may have committed, that they get to be put on trial. Wouldn't that be nice that we actually see justice served? What about the people who are over places like Exxon and BP? Instead of just paying fines, they actually face, you know, prison time. Like, I am a person that wants to change the prison system. At the same time, I would like for them to I would like for them to receive uh, punishment for doing what they did to people. And then, you know, maybe there could be like a re-education, you know, so that they can see how much they've damaged society. So just a thought. Corporations' very existence depends on the public. It is created when a state government, which could be any state, but for most major corporations is Delaware, issues a corporate charter. This is a legal grant of power and privilege from the state to the corporation. If a business continues to break the law, this charter should be taken away. This process is called corporate charter revocation. This is usually done by the Secretary of State or the Attorney General of the state that issued the charter. If a corporation that's incorporated out of state abuses its privileges in your state, its license to do business there can also be taken away. States have revoked corporate charters and business licenses for out-of-state corporations in the past by the will and pressure of the public. That's also a really interesting point because it has to be done by the will and the pressure of the public. Um, I honestly think that that's an avenue you can go in the meantime while we're trying to upend this system but yeah you can actually you know push you know to take away corporate charters for different corporations that are you know like for instance wouldn't it be lovely to see the corporate charter taken away from nestle or let's say amazon wouldn't that be nice? To basically signal, signal to them, play stupid games, you'll win stupid prizes. Fuck around and find out. I think that would be pretty nice. That's where you come in. Most people don't know about corporate charter reform, and they don't know that it's possible to deliver this just punishment that companies like BP, HSBC, and Massey deserve. It's up to us to make this known. Please share this video to spread the word. Okay.
<laughs> I like the way you think, Screw Google, or the corporations known as DNC and RNC. Yeah, that would be nice, too. That would really be nice. But yeah, that was that was also a really good um that was also a really good video as well. And then there was this uh interesting article as well that I wanted to share. Um, because this actually gives a little factoids a bit too, especially in the beginning. Uh it says billion sustaining worker cooperatives in the United States. It says compared to the rest of the world. Worker cooperatives make up a tiny portion of the U.S. economy. In a 2021 study, counted 612 worker cooperatives in the country. However, that number has risen significantly in recent years. Interest in worker cooperatives is also rising among businesses and workers, as well as investors, policymakers, and researchers. Those newly interested in worker cooperatives are coming into a movement at a time of deep economic inequality, wage stagnation, and job precarity. Against this backdrop, it is no surprise that a model for democratic workplaces where workers benefit more directly from profits of their labor is enjoying increased attention and support. In worker cooperatives, where workers in jointly own and manage the businesses that have agency over their working conditions and input into the business governance, these benefits translate into tangible economic outcomes. Cooperatives are more resilient to economic shocks, experience lower turnover among workers, and have higher productivity. Let's stop right there. Have any of you ever heard the phrase, people don't quit their jobs, they quit their managers? People don't quit their jobs, they quit their managers. What if you had the ability to have a democratic say over who manages you. Think about it. And if the manager doesn't do right by the workers, guess what? Out. Workers can go, but well, look, we, we all came together and we have a vote of no confidence over you as manager. So we're going to demote you. And then it's like, okay, so who do you guys want to manage? Okay. And then they have an election and manage, you know, the person, the per put the person who they want to, you know, manage them. And that's fine. But wouldn't that be a, a lot better instead of you having to quit because, oh my God, this manager, they're, you know, they are so terrible to the rest of us workers. Or what if you, what if you're a person and your manager's a creep? Wouldn't it be easier to just let this be known to your fellow coworkers and then go, I don't think this person should be a manager. They're being really creepy around, especially a lot of us women. Then it's like, okay, let's vote. Next thing you know, that person gets ousted and then they put in a new manager. Because it's more of a democratic say. You're less likely to leave. You're less likely to quit. And on top of that, if you're making, if you're sharing other profits on a year over year basis, then you're you're essentially a worker owner. And not only one, you'll take more pride in the company that you work for because you actually own a part of it. But at the same time, if you actually own a part of that company, you're going to make out better financially. It says these economic benefits for worker cooperatives translate into an economic benefits for individual workers and their families who earn equal or higher wages than workers in similar jobs and often have more family friendly workplaces. I was thinking about, like, for instance, if you work at, like, let's say a restaurant, and, you know, there was uh, some talk about uh, turnover, not turnover, uh, there was talk about uh, growth, right? And the necessity for growth isn't really that needed, right? Like, for instance, you can have a local restaurant, and if you guys 
are, you know, also a worker cooperative, but let's say, you know, the food company that you guys get your distribution from, they also are worker cooperative. You guys can work with cooperative co to cooperative, and then you guys have a special relationship. And then if more worker cooperatives grow, it's just better for the community overall. So that means that instead of all that money going outside of the company to some big wig, wig suit, Lex Luthor looking idiot, it's actually staying among workers and it's staying and circulating within the community, right? And it's just better because not only is that, but you guys also have a, a democratic say in the workplace, which also makes it harder for politicians to go to one particular person be like, hey, you know, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. It's like, no, no, it's, you have to do this for the collective. And if you do this for the collective, that means you have to have to do this for our community. If you do this for our community, then guess what? That means that you actually have to do what you say you're going to do. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. So I'm going to go to the chat really quick, but then I also want to look at some worker cooperatives that I didn't know that existed. I think that's going to be a fun, that's, that's the fun part of this that I actually want to look into. So. Natalie Williams says, JB, uh, the article was in Popular Mechanics, Google battery runs on oxygen oh i used to like popular mechanics when i was little even though i didn't really read it that much i just looked at the pictures but i thought it was pretty cool violin says pro tip if you get the power to revoke corporate charter you can po probably figure out how to seize its assets and convert co and convert corporation to workers cooperative Ooh. Violin, you making music, baby. Bob K says, I really hope people like JB Rome and other young people actually pull this off. If they do, I won't be around long enough to see it. Oh, uh, Bob, that's very, number one, that's very kind of you. Thank you so much. Number two, I hope you see it because you've been fighting for a long time, and I think you deserve to see the fruits of your labor. So thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Um, y'all talking about peanut butter and pickle sandwiches in the chat? Ew. Okay. Oh, you guys are talking about. <laughs> you guys are talking about nut butter. Travers Wolf says Richard Wolf talks about this a lot. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate Richard Wolf talking about this stuff a lot. And I think that, you know, he's part of the, the growing. Um, he's part of the growing consciousness of a lot of people now considering worker ownership, true worker ownership, not worker stock owner stock ownership. So I think that's also really important. All right, and so I know a lot of people are like, uh, oh, you, you go to Wikipedia, why? Well, this is just kind of, you know, innocuous, but it talks about all the worker cooperatives around the world. It says list of worker cooperatives. And these are some in, in, uh, in Asia, and this is particularly in India. And then it talks about Australia, New Zealand, Europe. So you have some in Denmark, France, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, UK. Uh, so some of these are very interesting. I saw this Green City Whole Foods. And it's like Green City Whole Foods is a work cooperative Whole Foods wholesaler in Glasgow, Scotland. <laughs> the cooperative was found in 1978 in Hillington and the outskirts of Glasgow were moving. To 1983, to its current location in Deniston, in the city of Easton. So, yeah, sorry, I had to do <laughs> my Scottish accent there. 
But yeah, this this is some cool stuff. There's even a worker cooperative in Israel. Israel says Egg Transportation Ltd. is the largest transit bus company in Israel. Eggs intercity bus routes uh, eat reach most of Israel cities, towns, uh, kibbutzim, and moshavim. And the company operates urban city buses throughout the the country. So that's actually a work cooperative out of out of Israel. And then, you know, okay, so <laughs> this is one of those moments I wish Rome was watching, or I wish Rome was here. Okay, there is this company called Come As You Are. Yo, this thing made me laugh so hard, Roger. If you're watching, you're gonna you're gonna look. Your eyes are gonna get big. It says, come as you are, is a sex positive sex shop located in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> it was founded in 1997 by Corey Silverberg as a worker owner cooperative in the model of the United States based Good Vibration. <laughs> the names, the names. Oh my God, you got these people are so, they're. Uh, they're clever and they're funny. Oh my gosh, it's called Come As You Are. And it's a co-op. That is so funny. It's a co-op sex shop. That is hilarious. This is uh this is one of the reasons why I'm so happy I research I, I started doing some research on this. This is great. This is just it doesn't just make you laugh, it makes you giddy all inside. Um, so there are some others. Uh, there's some others like uh, there's the Ag Agraric Technology Co Collective. This is out of Boston, Mass. So, it, you know, savvy if you're watching, then you have this. There's also Baltimore Bic Bicycle Networks out of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, you have bakeries in Buffalo, New York. Like, for instance, this one's out of Buffalo. You have ones out of Washington. Um and so if you guys know about any of these, you know, look at them and see, you know, like the, the, the driver's cooperative. Um, this is out of New York City. It says an, the driver's cooperative or co-op ride is an American ride sharing company and mobile app that is a worker's cooperative owning collectively by the drivers. It, uh, Roger, is this your cooperative that you work for? The cooperative launched in May of 2020 in New York City with its first 2,500 drivers issued their own ownership certificates in a media event. Roger, is this your is this your company that you're with? If that is, then that's cool. Please let me know, brother. You guys still talking about that name of that sex shop? Come as you come as you are. <laughs> oh, hang on. Let me let me do a violence comment really quick first, and then I'll get you yours. What did violence say? Uh, See, violence says Baltimore is one of those places where workers get hit hardest, first, and longest. They responded accordingly. Roger says, let me add to violence comment. Does everyone see how we have other pieces on the chessboard? Terrible players only use their queen, a.k.a. federal government. We got other pieces, rooks, a.k.a. CBIs, citizen ballot initiatives, bishops, a.k.a. governors. Roger Meadow says, I have to go to Canada. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Get up there and spread your maple syrup. <laughs> okay, Rabble Rouser. This is, let me see, a demagogue or Rabble Rouser is a political leader in a democracy who gains popularity by arousing the common people against elites, especially through oratory that whips up the passions of crowds appealing to emotion by scapegoating out groups. I don't know what that is, but okay. Rainbow Grocery Cooperative is a worker owned and run food cooperative located in San Francisco. Founded in 1975, Rainbow Grocery 
is a member of no BAWC. Hang on. Uh, no BAWC in the United States Federation of Worker Cooperatives. Hard Times Cafe out of Minneapolis says this is a collectively owned restaurant in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood of Minneapolis, Minnesota. It is known for its punk and hippie ideology, its gritty ambiance, and its large selection of vegan and vegetarian food is open from 8 a.m. to midnight every day. I'd go there. Shoot. And a lot of these ones in red, it's because they don't have a, an explanation in their Wikipedia. But if you go to the little number here, you actually can go to their website. And so, like, for instance, this one goes to WooRides.com. And so um, it says Wool Rides is a low carbon emission vehicle fleet offering electric hybrid and people power transportation services and products serving Worcestershire's Worcestershire. Oh, wait, is this in, uh, I think this is uh, out of Boston. Is it uh, Worcester? Re uh, Sabi would know. Worcester's resident families and workers and youth. We are concerned for our ecology in which humans are a part and believe that greening our transportation is key to creating a resilient community. That is why we believe that in using sustainable transportation technologies as a worker cooperative, workers will benefit from consistency and stabilization and communities and ownership and decision making. We envision alternative futures rooted in sustainable transportation technologies, equitable cities and small business enterprise. We guide our work via lens of fun, environmentally sustainable, affordability, accessibility, and community engagement. Whether to plan an event, enjoy life, or promote a market of your business, we're here for you. So, yeah. So, a lot of these are just really cool because they actually show, you know, different um, worker cooperatives that you guys can actually use for your business, you know. Um, let me see. There was one, there was a coffee shop out of, um, out of Boston that I saw it. I'm like, they even do tea. I'm like, Savvy, I wonder if she goes there. But you also have ones like out of Oakland, California, out formations. What's this? Out formations is, uh. Let me see. Agile transformation. I didn't get to look at this one, but yeah. But there's so many different ones. And for many of business needs that you guys might need. So... Take a look at, you know, research, like, especially if you're in these, any of these cities, there are a lot out of, you know, New York, Vermont, Wisconsin, Massachusetts. Uh, there's this one in Washington, D.C. Just look for local worker cooperatives in your area and truth be told, just try to support them, you know. Use them for your business needs, you know, instead of going to a lot of these corporations. And if you absolutely have to use a corporation, and yeah, I mean, you have to do what you have to do. But if you can avoid them and use worker cooperatives so you can keep them their business up, then by all means, you know, I would like to see more, you know, here in Orlando. And if there are, then I would like to go to them, you know. So that would be nice. So, yeah. Oh, hail. What's up, man? <laughs> Weren't expecting to see me, huh? Yo, when I saw that worker cooperative that was a sex shop, I was just like, Rome, Rome's going to come up in here. <laughs> they said, come as you they are. Said, come huh? as you are, bro. I was, I was like, done, bro. I was just like, yo, what? I, I still think my my uh uh my name for my candy store is better, uh, uh candy from a stranger. But <laughs> we'll see. 
We we'll see. What's up, my brother? You, you looking looking all fresh and and, and and shiny and new. Man, I just I I took a bath finally. I, I finally took a shower. I wasn't uh, <laughs> moping in my own depression and shit. But I've been I've been listening to the show, man. I've been listening to the show about the worker co-ops and whatnot. And I know it's always gonna be somebody that's a naysayer like me. I'm a naysayer. I'm one of the biggest naysayers that that's probably on this platform. You know, especially when it comes to working with some of these co-ops or working uh, within certain parties or whatnot. If you guys feel like, you know, these people aren't pushing, you know what I'm saying, your narrative isn't pushing your ideology, isn't as far as left with you, you can always build your own. You know, it it only seems hard because they, you know what I'm saying, they make it seem that way. You know, and I had told you guys, I, I, I get a, I established a, a whole party. On my own, you know, saying with the help of JB, he actually made up the name of the party. You know, uh, CT and a handful of people. We got a, a party going ourselves. You know, uh, worker co-ops going on. You know, I'm I'm got a clinic that's going out that, that's going to be opening up in Boston pretty soon. If you guys feel like nobody's moving at your speed, or they might be moving too slow for you, uh, moving too fast for you, you can always build your own. And this way. You know, uh, you, you will know what's going down. You ain't got to ask no questions. You ain't got to, you know, worry about people being shitey, uh, uh, shy, uh, sorry, shysty or grimy at the top, skimming money. Uh, uh, you know, you, you will be in full control of it. And then you can see how it really goes down. Then you can see how, uh, how much work you actually have to put into this shit. But it's not hard at all. The hardest part is maintaining it and keeping it up keep and keep pushing that's probably the hardest part easiest part you can do is get on the ground and just you know what I'm saying make it make it what it is but i won't run behind. oh no i will never be styling <laughs> your motherfuckers ain't getting me like that <laughs> but uh it's uh it, definitely not winning but it, it, it's a lot of good co-ops out here y'all there's a lot of good workers out here, socialist movements. You know, uh, I don't run into even some uh, some people that teach people uh, how to shoot CPO classes, gun ranges. They all socialist led. And you guys, you know, we can we can do that. We can do that also. You know, it don't take much. All it takes for you to open up your fucking mouth sometimes. Speak your mind. You might not be the most popular, you know, but so be it. You know, if people like Benjamin uh, uh, Ben Shapiro or... You know, Matt Wash and all these motherfuckers can get a platform. Why not you? They got millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people listening to their uh, their will and their goals and, you know, investing in them. Why can't you? You know, we have we have actual idiots with armies around them. You can do the same and actually build something for the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. 